Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is July 22nd. In 2012, Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France. Wiggins, 32, finished with a winning margin of 3 minutes and 21 seconds after ending Sunday's race around the streets of Paris in the Peloton. Fellow Brit and Team Sky teammate Chris Froome consolidated second place with Italy's Vincenzo Nibali third. Cavendish won the traditional sprint down the Champs Elysees with some ease. The 27-year-old from the Isle of Man is unbeaten in Paris, having also won his, on his three previous tour finishes in 2009, 10, and 11. He began his sprint early and held off the challenge of faster finishing Peter Sagan of Slovakia with Australia's Matthew Gross third. It lifted his tally of Tour de France stage wins to 23 to surpass seven-time Tour winner Lance Armstrong and Frenchman Andre Degar and move into the fourth in the overall stage win standings, 11 short of Belgian Eddie Merck's record of 34. But the day belonged to Wiggins, who safely nav- navigated and negotiated himself around the streets of Paris to complete the formalities after Saturday's stunning time trial victory gave him an almost unassailable lead. The three-time Olympic track champion crossed the line, arms raised, having helped set up Cavendish's sprint victory in front of thousands of British fans on the Champs Elysees who had come to witness history being made. And in winning this year's tour, Wiggins not only fulfilled a lifelong ambition, but also sealed his place in the pantheon of cycling greats. I don't know what to say. I've had 24 hours for it to soak in, said Wiggins. I'm still buzzing from the Champs Elysees. The laps go so quick. We had a mission with Cav, and we did it. What a way to finish it off. I've got to get used to that, being a legend in the spotlight. It's going to take a while. I'm just trying to soak it all in. You never imagined it will happen to you, but it's amazing. In three demanding weeks, he toiled over the Alps and the Pyrenees to complete a mammoth 20-stage, 2,173-mile race, which was in its 99th edition. During his stunning transition from track to road racing, Wiggins finished fourth in the Tour in 2009, equaling Robert Millar's 1984 British best before crashing out with a broken collarbone when among the favorites in 2011. But having worn the yellow jersey for 13 consecutive stages, Wiggins showed why Team Sky principal Dave Brailsford has placed so much faith in his man as he accumulated a winning margin of more than three minutes. The margin of Wiggins' victory also answered many of those who questioned why Froome, who appeared marginally stronger in the mountains, was not a Team Sky's tour leader. Team Sky themselves achieved a rare feat of a 1-2 on the podium, the first since 1996 when Dane Bjarne Ries finished ahead of his German teammate at Telecom, Jan Ulrich. It is also the first time compatriots have taken the first two places since Francis Lerner Figon finished ahead of five-time winner Bernard Hanault in the 1984 edition. Frenchman Thomas Vokler of Europe Car won the polka dot jersey for the race's best climber. It was Sagan and the liquid gas team easily securing the green jersey for the points competition. American TJ Van Garderen made up for the BMC team leader Cadell Evans' disastrous title defense by winning the race's white jersey for the best placed rider age 25 and under. Evans, who made history by becoming Australia's first champion in 2011, finished nearly 16 minutes behind Wiggins, although he did suffer with stomach problems during the final week. In 1933, pilot Wiley Post returned to Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, New York, seven days, 18 hours, and 49 minutes after leaving. Aided by a new technology, his flight is the first solo circumnavigation by air, and it is also the fastest ever around the world trip. Born in Texas, Post wanted to be a pilot after seeing his first airplane at a county fair at the age of 15. He got his break at age 24 when a barnstormer let him fill in for his injured skydiver. Post performed several jumps, but always wanted to be the pilot, not the skydiver. His dream was almost ruined while working in the oil fields to earn money for an airplane. He lost his left eye in an accident. Despite the lack of depth of perception... Post was able to earn his pilot's license and, with his workers' compensation checks, bought his first airplane. 
Post quickly advanced his flying skills and became the personal pilot for the wealthy oilman F.C. Hall. His boss encouraged Post to use the plane when it wasn't needed for business, and the now 32-year-old pilot promptly went out and won a prestigious air race from Los Angeles to Chicago. With a success, Hall allowed Post to use the sleek Lockheed Vega aircraft named Winnie Mae after Hall's daughter to pursue any air records he wished. Post wasted no time, but in 1931, he and navigator Harold Gaddy broke the around-the-world record that had been held by an airship, the Graf Zeppelin. Their 15,000-mile flight lasted 8 days, 15 hours, 51 minutes, and included 13 refueling stops. The Winnie Mae had slashed more than 11 days off the previous record. After several people suggested Gaddy was the brains behind the effort, Post set out to disprove his critics the very next year by making a solo trip. He equipped the Vega with two significant pieces of new technology, a primitive autopilot from Sperry Gyroscope and a radio direction finder for navigation. The trip would be the first significant flight where new navigation technology would replace a human navigator. The early autopilot proved to be problematic at times, though it did help solo pilots stand his desired course, aided by the radio direction finder that allowed Post to navigate to any radio station's transmitter. The Winnie Mae stayed on a record pace through the early part of the flight. After several unscheduled stops in the Soviet Union and the need to fix a bent propeller, Post was able to make it back to North America still ahead of schedule. Fighting fatigue in the, f- fatigue in the final hours, Post developed a very simple piece of technology to keep from falling asleep at the cockpit. A former mechanic tied one end to- of a string to a wrench and the other end to a finger. He would simply hold the wrench while he flew. If he fell asleep, the wrench would fall, tugging on his finger, waking him up. The cluggy wrench alarm worked, and the, as the clock approached midnight, Post landed back at Floyd Bennett Field in front of thousands of spectators who had come to greet him. He credited the autopilot and radio direction finder for making the record-setting flight possible. He had beaten his previous record by 21 hours. Post would later go on to develop a pressure suit, allowing him to set more records by flying at altitudes as high as 40,000 feet. In 1935, the record-setting pilot set off in a flight with his good friend Will Rogers. The famous humorist had hired Post to fly him around Alaska in search of new material for his newspaper column. Post ended up settling for some pontoon floats that were too big for the modified Lockheed when they were flying on the trip. Post and Rogers took off from a lake in northern Alaska on August 15th, and the engine quit. The airplane was too difficult to control with the oversized floats, and it crashed into a lake, killing both on board. Rogers of 55... Post was 36. John Dillinger was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1903. A juvenile delinquent, he was arrested in 1924 after a botched mugging. He pleaded guilty, hoping for clemency, but was sentenced to 10 to 20 years at Pendleton Reformatory. While in prison, he made several failed escapes and was adopted by a group of professional bank robbers led by Harry Pierpoint, who taught him the ways of the trade. When his friends were transferred to Indiana's tough Michigan City prison, he requested to be transferred there too. In May of 1933, Dillinger was paroled and he met up with accomplices of Pierpont. Dillinger's plan was to raise enough funds to finance a prison break by Pierpont and the others, who would then take him on as a member of their elite robbery gang. In four months, Dillinger and his gang robbed four Indiana and Ohio banks, two grocery stores, and a drug store for the total of more than $40,000. He gained notoriety as a sharply dressed and athletic gunman who at one bank leapt over the high teller railing into the vault. With the help of two of Pierpont's women friends, Dillinger set up the jailbreak. Guns were brought, bought and arranged to be smuggled into the Michigan City prison. Prison workers were bribed and a safe house was set up. On September 22nd, however, just days before the jailbreak was scheduled to occur, Dillinger was arrested in Dayton, Ohio. Four days later, Pierpont and nine others broke out of Michigan City. Pierpont's gang robbed a bank in Ohio for $11,000 and on October 12th came to Ohio to free Dillinger from the Lima City Jail. The Lima Sheriff was killed during the successful breakout. On October 30th, the gang robbed a police arsenal, acquiring weapons, ammunition, and bulletproof vests. The Pierpont Dillinger gang robbed banks in Indiana, Wisconsin, and Chicago for more than $130,000, a great fortune in the Depression era, and eluded the police in several close encounters. In January 1934, the gang headed to Tucson, Arizona, to lay low. By this time, four police officers had been killed and two wounded, and the Chicago police had established an elite squad to track down fugitives. They were recognized in Tucson and on January 25th captured without bloodshed. Dillinger was extradited to Indiana, arraigned for his January 15th murder of Indianapolis police or Indiana police officer William Patrick O'Malley and held at Crown Point Prison. On March 3rd, while still awaiting trial, he executed his most celebrated escape. 
That morning, he brandished the gun and methodically began locking up the prison officials. The legend is that the weapon was a wooden gun carved by Dillinger and blackened with shoe polish, but it may have also been a real gun smuggled into the prison by an associate. Whatever the case, Dillinger raided the prison arsenal where he found two submachine guns and then enlisted the aid of another prisoner, an African-American named Herbert Youngblood. Dillinger and Youngblood then made their way to the prison garage where they stole a sheriff's car and calmly drove off after pulling the ignition wires from all the other vehicles parked there. Parting ways with Youngblood, Dillinger traveled to Chicago and formed a new gang featuring Babyface Nelson, a psychopathic killer who used to work for Al Capone. The new Dillinger gang robbed banks in South Dakota and Iowa, netting $101,500 and wounding two more police officers. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, joined the manhunt for Dillinger after he escaped from Crown Point, and on March 31st, two FBI agents closed in on him in an apartment in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dillinger and an accomplice shot their way out. In April, the Dillinger gang went on to hide out at a resort in Wisconsin, but the FBI was tipped off. On April 22nd, the FBI stormed the report, and in a disastrous operation, three civilians were mistakenly shot by the FBI, one of whom died. Babyface Nelson killed one agent, shot another, and critically wounded a police officer. The entire Dillinger gang escaped. With the two other gang members, Dillinger traveled to Chicago, surviving a shootout with Minnesota police along the way. In Chicago, he lived in a safe house and got a facelift to conceal his identity. At some point, he also used acid to burn off his fingerprints. On June 30th, he participated in his last robbery in South Bend, Indiana. The gang got away with about $30,000 at the cost of one officer killed, four civilians shot, and one gang member shot. In July, Anna Sage, a Romanian-born brothel madam in Chicago and friend of Dillinger's, agreed to cooperate with the FBI in exchange for leniency in an upcoming deputy deportation hearing. She also hoped to cash in on the $10,000 bounty that had been put on his head. On July 22nd, Sage and Dillinger went to see the gangster movie Manhattan Melodrama at the Biograph Theater around the corner from her house. Twenty FBI agents and police officers staked out the theater and waited for him to emerge with Sage, who would be wearing an orange dress to identify herself. At 10.40, Dillinger came out Sage's orange dress looked red under the Biograph's lights, which would earn her the nickname The Lady in Red. Dillinger was ordered to surrender, but he took off running. He made it as far as an alley at the end of the block before he was gunned down, allegedly because he pulled a gun. Two bystanders were wounded in the gunfire, public enemy number one, as FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had deemed him, was dead. Some researchers have claimed that another man, not Dillinger, was killed outside the biograph, citing autopsy findings on the corpse that allegedly contradict Dillinger's known medical record. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com Bradley Wiggins wins Tour de France at BBC.com Wiley Post at Wired.com and John Dillinger Shot at History.com The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.